we'll get started. So um, my name is Rebecca Wright, Professor and Director of Computer Science at Barnard College. I am the chair of the Cybersecurity Center at the Data Science Institute, and I'm happy to welcome you today to our Data for Good seminar. The Cybersecurity Center takes an intentionally broad approach to cybersecurity with participation from faculty in computer science, law, public policy, biomedical informatics, business, and more. And we're dedicated to developing the capacity for keeping data secure and private throughout its lifetime, to ensuring that cyber infrastructure remains secure, trustworthy, and resilient, and to advancing the ways that technology policy and education can work together towards cybersecurity. As many of you may know, Barnard College is a premier liberal arts college for women. Barnard students obtain both Barnard and Columbia degrees and can take advantage of the wealth of opportunities across both. I joined Barnard in 2019 to lead the creation of Barnard's own program in computer science. We continue to collaborate quite closely with Columbia Computer Science as we build curriculum and community at Barnard and with a particular focus on the multidisciplinary connections of computing. So in that theme, it is a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jean Camp. I've known Jean for decades and have um, particularly fond memories of spending time with her discussing privacy and trust in the Caribbean islands in the early 2000s, where the Financial Cryptography Conference took place every February. Uh, professor Camp's bio reflects her highly multidisciplinary approach and interests. She is a professor at the School of Informatics and Computing at Indiana University. Her research focuses on the intersection of human and technical trust, leveraging economic models and human-centered design to create secure, safe systems. She's been recognized for her contributions as a fellow of the IEEE and the AAAS. Uh, prior to Indiana, she was a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where her courses were cross-listed at Harvard Law, Harvard Business, and the Engineering Systems Division of MIT. And you can further see her, um, her broad interests by uh, the earlier time she spent as technical staff member at Sandia National Laboratories, as an engineer at Catawba Nuclear Station, and as a congressional fellow in the Office of North Carolina Representative Bob Etheridge. She will talk to us today about her work taking a multidisciplinary approach to understanding and mitigating security risks in internet routing. Professor Camp, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that everybody can see my slides and I very much appreciate your time today. Yes, the topic is reckoning with routing. So I will be down a bit in the weeds, but I also want to argue that even at this very basic level where we're talking about uh, the internet protocol con control plane, there is still a human component and that integrating that human component and awareness of it at every step of the research creates a superior, more robust outcome. Oh, yes, that is working, good. So I am also talking about data science or machine learning and security, which is different than machine learning in other domains, particularly because we have somebody who's really trying to break what we're doing. You may, um, I'm sure we're all reading about how the models in, in climate models predicted or at least indicated a higher probability of the events in Texas. The weather may hurt us, but it's not doing it on purpose. Whereas our adversaries are intelligent and engaged and may have complete information about defender models. This includes sometimes literally insiders in the company, the security company, uh, often because they have subverted accounts, not because these are, you know, bad or disloyal people, but because their authentication has been subverted. And also customers, when you send something out all over the world to sell it, there's going to be some bad people who buy it. So, and the other core problem that we see in security over and over again is the labeled data problem. It's that we are uh, at risk of focusing on those problems that we can detect. And that will come up in the very uh, end part of this slide. So how do we deal with that? In a, in a systematic way. Before I get down into the weeds, I want to say, what I try to do is identify the core behavior to implement an attack. So I got a fraud call today. The core behavior necessary to implement that attack was that the phone call presented as if it were from the United States. 
it was one of these fake social security calls. So that is what the attackers had to do. Um, it was not detected. It was probably almost certainly detected by the network as not originating in the US, but that information was not shared with me. That information was not used to support human decision-making. It was used to um, you know, optimize the call and decide you know, yes or no, but the decision variables were not made visible. I am a huge fan of integrating artificial intelligence and human intelligence. So how do we support mitigation? This isn't actually uh, routing, this is an insider threat image, but I like it. I, we, we identify things quickly. We try to say, oh, this is different. This is different. I, you know, the computer is very good at identifying changes and remembering exactly all that has happened before. We use features the attacker cannot control. So they have to call my phone to make this fraud happen. And they cannot control where my phone is and they cannot control my phone display. If they're controlling my phone display, I am so hacked anyway. So how do you prevent a successful attack in a way that is genuinely uh, human-centered and about protecting people is understanding the attacker's goal and then preventing them from reaching it, right? Not like, let's characterize these. And as we support human decision-making, we need to align with users' mental models. Um, I've been a huge advocate of bringing warning science to computer security, automate what can be automated, and require that risk-taking be chosen and informed. Uh, like passwords are a great example of do something humans cannot do. That is to say, generate large amounts of randomness without any contextual information, remember them perfectly, and then do this you know, a thousand times. But we are good at enabling easy override, understanding the role like with passwords of the override in attacks and reset attacks. And the other thing we have to do as we use ML is, as you go on the market, you'll say, oh, this is learning ML. This ML is going to learn. It's going to be great. It's going to optimize. Well, it turns out the attackers in solar winds went undetected because they logged in from the same city and time zone. And the system, which had originally been field, fielded with a lot of variables, um, fingerprinting the device and making sure it was the right device, slowly learned over time you know, the only thing that matters is location. And the vast majority of cases in security are benign. So we have this chronically unbiased data set. This is something that machine learning struggles with generally. Here is, uh, I think, a very funny picture of LinkedIn one day decided I needed a new job. Uh, so I'm a fellow of the AAAS, a fellow of the IEEE. They think I would be a great kinder care teacher or maybe a, a, a educational coordinator with kids. Clearly, it's the same phenomenon. You go to like one variable, one or two variables, they give you this great prediction. The system learns that these are the variables that matter. The difference here is the attackers in solar wind are focusing, are looking for, a, you know, there's attackers seeking to subvert it. Now, what is the context? Let's go back to the title. I've talked about human-centered and general things. What is an attack on the control plane? Usually these are prefix hijacking. And that is what you may have read about before. This is, there was this prefix hijacking. And in prefix hijacking, a ISP sends false connectivity information. They just lie. And they say, oh, send your data over here. I totally want to look at it. A route leak is an ISP sending incorrect connectivity information. They look the same, but one is an accident. And um, as we do this, so we have this thing where I have some people screwing up and some people being malicious. And at the same time, there's literally a million ent entries in the global routing table right now. Um, 
how do we know which variables matter about which ones are screw ups and which ones are attacks? Well, we go back, we align the variable with the core goal, we test for drift, we don't simply reweigh, we look at the variables. We periodically use local data to re-inform our analysis and feature selection of the global data. And again, in security, precision is not recall, right? If you say, oh, um, this good thing is bad, well, then maybe you didn't you know, purchase those wonderful scented candles. Um, if you say this bad thing is good, you could get hacked and it is fundamentally different payoff or cost. So what do you do? You perturb traffic and you change the flow. So I'm going to go through this step by step. Don't worry about it. So it turns out there are more than four autonomous systems on the internet. It's 2021 or like week 60 of 2020. Um, so what they have to do to make this work, which I will explain, they have to alter the routing information. They have to get other people to accept that routing information and that alters the traffic flow. And then they obtain the traffic of their targets. So identify hijacks versus natural errors, limit announcement diffusion. And if you identify it, you can't just limit it. You can't just stop it from going forward because it will cause these huge routing storms, um, like the world's worst incredibly digital traffic jam. And you need to do it quickly. What we really want to do is limit data loss. So if you start you know, announcing something different and you don't do it in a careful manner, you're going to increase disruption. So, all right, let's go back to this picture now with more soothing colors as we're going through it. All right, so you have four networks. To get to the first one says AS3, it just means, look, you know, if I want to go to AS1, if I want to go to ISP1, AS is autonomous system. It can be an ISP like Comcast. It can be a content delivery network like uh, Netflix actually owns its own content delivery network. And if you want to go from four to one, you go through two. Right, so that's all this says. So AS4, three, and then one. AS2 says, oh, I want to get to one. I can just go to one. But um, if I want to go to four from two, I have to go through three, three, then one. All right, so um, this is everyone announcing nice, peaceful, correct information. AS4 wants to get, it tells everybody in the world, if you connect to me, I am going to take two hops to get to AS1. Whereas AS3 tells everyone in the world, if you connect to me, I can get to both one and two and four. So you might prefer to connect to AS3. And AS2 is like, if you wanna to get to me, I can get to one and three, but probably not four. So you send this out in the world and then a link breaks. The link between three and two breaks. And so what happens, sorry, when you get there is four suddenly says, oh, I have to go through three and then two and then one, alas. Three says, I'd like to get to one. Now I have to go through two. So this is either a hijack or it's just, it's congested. I mean, you're just, you're just taking a right-hand turn going across, I guess you guys would go across the island, right? Is that correct? And then to avoid traffic, good luck with that. And then it's fixed and everything goes back to normal. The other thing that happens is, and this is why it's called prefix, is that you say, you know, not all of this slash 24, not all of those addresses belong to, you know, you don't, you don't go there for all of those addresses. If you want to go to a little sub part of the addresses, right? If you want to go to like a, a subset of those addresses, then you should just go a different way. 
So the way you say this is slash in and the slash indicates the number of bits which are available for sub addresses. So a slash eight um, I'm sure you've heard of those discussions. Those are policy discussions. So what are hijacks? Why do people do it? Let's think about the attacker. What about the attacker's news? Huh, it's linked to spam. It's linked to deep packet inspection, which is linked to politics, which is linked to malware. So why are these things happening? Well, sometimes it's just money. So Here's a famous attack where there were a bunch of Bitcoin miners, which means that they were engaging in coordinated investment of computing cycles to generate additional Bitcoins. And then when they got a Bitcoin, they take it to um, Amazon and put it down and then they, everybody would share in the proceeds. So this guy is working at Canadian telecoms like, mm, you don't get a lot of evil Canadians, but uh, Maybe I should just steal all their Bitcoins. So what he did was he just announced that he owned a little tiny piece of Amazon, just a little slash 28. And they all went and sent him the results of their Bitcoin transactions and he made tens of thousands of dollars. He was also busted. So this is what it looks like um, if you look at it. So here is uh, Amazon. And the attacker just said, oh no, this 24, don't, oh, just this little bit of Amazon, I own this. And how did they get away with that? What they did was all the other traffic, they just let it keep flowing. They just stole the Bitcoins. Now there's another one that happened that's a little interesting. And, and because the way networks are owned in the US, if you're sending something from Denver to Denver, it might go from Dallas to Kansas City because there are five major backbone providers in the US and they don't all have facilities in the same town. So, you know, you're sending something from Denver, you're like, oh, it goes to, it's going to, you know, Chicago. So maybe there's weather in Dallas, it's totally normal. But in this case, it went to Chicago and from Chicago, it went to Virginia. Now that could still make sense, right? Ashburn, Virginia, is one of the largest uh, internet infrastructure facilities in the world. Um, and then it went to New York. Okay, everybody wants to go to New York, even packets. And that's where it got strange. And then it went to London. It went to the what is, what is the world's largest single internet inter exchange in London. But then it went to this tiny little third tier um, ISP in Iceland that was apparently later, it looked like hacked by some large bearish neighbors. So why Denver? Denver has some beautiful sites. You can see the aerospace data facility, NORAD, US Northcom, Cheyenne Mountain, which is a, uh, the backup facility for all of these. If you go a little bit outside, you can see Peterson Air Force Base, the Air Force Academy, and then the other Air Force Base, which as you can see from the huge spherical antennas is very engaged also in surveillance. So why hijack? Maybe it's spies, maybe it's crimes. We looked at routine activity theory and instrumented, and that is, th these are like three big crime theories. I am making no claims to innovation in criminology. I am using criminology. And that's, you know, motivated offenders, available targets, lack of oversight. Uh, economic deprivation is just, I might have a car, but you might have a Tesla. I have a nice little place in Bloomington. You get to live in New York, so it can be relative. Lack of social support means lack of economic options. So when we see these, we often see routine activity. If you found a bunch of cash lying on the ground, you'd say, hooray, let me pick it up. In fact, legally, what you are supposed to do is take that cash to the police and say, oh gosh, I found $427 laying on the sidewalk. Please keep it for 60 days. And if no one reports it lost, uh, I will come and you can return it. And then I can enter it on my taxes. Like 
that is literally legally what you're supposed to do. So yeah, it's like copyright violations. It's a routine activity. We all do it. Uh, lack of social support is, you've seen this sometimes in the, uh, what we need is governance. We need, you know, um, and then economic deprivation. So instrumenting that means fixed broadband subscribers for 100K people. Are there motivated offenders? Do they exist? Are you on the internet? Available targets, secure internet servers per million, lack of oversight, which is about governance. Economic deprivation is all about the money, GDP per capita by purchasing power parity, and that is the only time I'm saying the whole acronym. And then lack of social support, lack of other options. There's not communications, computer, other exports. If you have computer expertise, you can do crime and that's it, sorry. Uh, previous results have shown examples of all of these. Illegal copying of software is very strongly indicated by economic deprivation. Spam is lack of social support, the same variable, so we're not making this up. And more crime, if you look at freelancer versus MTurk, you get routine activity theory. And uh, some of the studies of Russian e-crime have found both routine activity theory and lack of social support. I will be declining this call. All right, thank you. So back to BGP, it can be criminal activity, it can be simple mistakes, it can be, you know, spy versus spy. So which is it? Well, we what we did was we took three years of hijacking information. We took our instrumented variables and we said, hey, what does it look like? What are the attackers trying to do? And then we said, oh, um, SIS, which is secure internet servers versus anomalies. Wow, that is a really nice line. That would be a criminology explanation of routine activity theory is what I'm showing you here. And it says, wow, that, that looks pretty good. But then there's some weird anomalies in there. And the interesting thing about these anomalies is when we label them by country, it doesn't change year by year. And then let's look at um, availability. What about secure internet servers? Oh, that's pretty good. Most of the data aligns pretty well, except for again, the United States, a little weird. There's another little cluster up there. Um, for none of the years were we able to reject the hypothesis that the distributions were the same. I mean, and you see it on the graph, every dot is close to the dot of the other country. That's the non-technical way to say it. So we found some really good arguments for routine activity theory. We looked at um, uh, broadband, we looked at secure internet servers, and we looked at governance, which are World Bank measures of rule of law and corruption. But we also found that it's not all crime. There's definitely another cluster. Hmm. What could that other cluster be? Oh gosh, look, it is correlated with governance. If we take out the US, which is just an extreme outlier in all of these, and we look at the years, it seems like there is not only more negative, so you're seeing more negative, notice, and it goes down, that's more, that's because the world government indicators means more transparency, more corruption, less rule of law. So gosh, what do we see there? We see countries that are involved in either uh, external conflict, like uh, war, or have active internal conflict with the exception of Comoros. So Comoros, hmm, where is Comoros? Why might that be true? Here's a subset of those hijacked hotspots. If you showed a map in 1920 of telegraph lines, you would see some of the same hotspots. Comoros is a tiny little red, red spot. It is where um, and our modern day fibers for the same geographical reasons follow the same paths as those telegraph lines. Of course, we see a noticeable lack of these, for example, in Greenland and Iceland, which is where there's a huge concentration of uh, fiber and traditionally telegraph lines. So I have looked at the reasons 
So what kind of solutions do we have? Well, there's a bunch of cryptographic solutions. There's resource public key infrastructure, which validates the source. It's like, this is definitely Amazon. And then there's BGPSEC, which is the full pass validation. This is Amazon. This is, this is Denver, and it totally did not go through Iceland. All right. So RPKI, origin violation, provides cryptographic attestation between a network and an IP range. And that is now getting adopted. It only prevents certain classes of, I, of BGP attacks. The Bitcoin attack would not have worked, but the Denver attack would have worked. Because in Denver, they did not lie about where the traffic was going. They lied about how to get there. So BGPSEC is a full pass validation. Um, it is incredibly expensive. And it turns out that if a government is releasing uh, um, certificates to its telecom or national operator, they are still not a trustworthy communications partner. And also it requires the full path. So why do I have pictures of this lovely garden wall? Because this is just like what you see in BGP sec, you would have to uh, find a place where it's not fully implemented, or you would just have to go around the part of the network which implements it. And these are also systems level approaches. They require updating the entire infrastructure. BGP would be, sec would be so expensive and thus it's been around for like 20 years and nobody uses it. And there means there's only one risk level that we all know exactly how much we trust that other autonomous system. In the past two years, there's been a new approach that is very human centered called banners. We all wanna have nice manners. Um, it stands for mutually agreed norms for routing security. If you read my Goofus and Gallant cartoon a few slides back, you would see that Gallant practices good manners, whereas Goofus just irresponsibly releases uh, routing updates. It requires identifying contact people for questions. So if you think something is wrong, you can contact them. It mandates a level of data sharing and it provides support for RPKI, which is the one that says I own this IP address, deployment with peer outreach. So that if you're deploying RPKI and something breaks, everybody knows what your deployment problem is and they're waiting to take your phone call. So our solution is about empowering the individual who may be at risk. So BGP tells you what it's gonna do. I mean, even when it's averted, it tells you what it's gonna do. So you hit a little trace route, trace route comes back. It says, these are the ASs I'm going to be taking. This is the path. So, um, but you cannot alter it because it's a system property where everyone must agree or the system does not function. So what you can do is you can say, mm, never mind, if you are taking this route, I will delay my availability. And this is complementary to manners because you may be able to then contact the uh, correct people. You'll, you'll know, you'll literally know who to call if you are experiencing this. So, you know, in the second cartoon, the data source is supposed to be waving goodbye. I am indeed keeping my day job. One of the things we found in a lot of the hijacks, particularly our analysis of hijacks, is the when you initiate a message and in one jurisdiction and you're going to that jurisdiction, unless you're Liechtenstein, and even when you are Liechtenstein quite a bit of the time, the traffic normally stays in that jurisdiction. Most of the bits here should be going from me to New York. And once we started looking at that, we saw how it would be useful for other attacks like the Ukrainian grid controllers when they took down the Ukrainian systems, the democratic email systems. But there are other places where much more fingerprinting is needed like the attacks against the gas lines last year um, and the solar winds attacks where the problem was they only looked at location. 
So if you think about this, again, in interdisciplinary terms, each autonomous system is a particular organization. Most of them are ISPs. Most ISPs are evolved from um, national uh, TTPs, which are telegram, telegraph, and post. So many countries have a single dominant ISP. And they have very different opinions on what is acceptable speech, what is censorship, and what is the correct level of security. So suppose we did this. We say, let's, you communicate with known addresses. Like, you have your own path. You have your local history. And you exchange data with a set of organizations and partner organizations. You know where your remote data center is. Suppose we just did BGP path restrictions for the ISP addresses that you knew well. If it changes, you get notified. And you can pause your transmission. So we said, suppose this worked for the 50 largest banks. I believe the biggest bank hijack in history was when the North Korean government stole the World Bank payment for Bangladesh, and that was a scary amount of money. So, juris so we said, well, let's look at how disruptive would this be? Will the security be worse than the insecurity? And so we looked at this as if you're an individual organization, if you're a single university, well, universities don't work because we talk to everybody. If you're a single company, what would you do? And then we built it. We, the, it's named Bongo because the original um, kind of uh, BGP um, system we built it on was called the Zebra. And then it that has been built to Quagga. It's been expanded. We have it on GitHub. And Bongo is an ungulate. Can you see this? My horns keep disappearing. It is the only grazing animal where all the adults have horns and is capable of self-defense. So what we said is you can decide on your own peer reputation. Does your company do business in China? Do you have contacts that you're working with in Iceland? If not, your traffic shouldn't go there. And we have in the code an example of generating an open flow rule, which is what you would use with SDN. Um, looking at static routes, which are frequently used routes that you would want to be concerned with that should not vary. And also it connects with a firewall, allowing you to generate access control rules that say, uh, can we pause this for a minute? How disruptive would this be? we looked at changes in jurisdiction of the top 50 banks for a month. And so of the top 50, these were the only ones where there was jurisdiction changes. And HSBC, sometimes you hit the New York office, sometimes you hit the UK office. Uh, ICBC, sometimes you went through Hong Kong, sometimes you went through China and Hong Kong, right? But since you're starting in China, Sometimes you made a, a little loop there. The only thing that would have been disrupted is the National Bank of Iran, which sometimes goes through Russia, uh, which means it's going from Europe to the US. Sometimes it goes through Oman, which means it's taking that route through Comoros. And sometimes it goes through Germany. And these were all from the US. So that is the only jurisdiction flapping we saw. So 50 financial service internet addresses, IP address ranges, one would have dropped off the internet only for experienced country changes. So how about fast identification? So if you're an individual, you can protect yourself. How do we do fast identification? Well, you have to announce the false routes. And so it turns out that we took some, we took some um, classic hijacks. Like in periodically, China, Malaysia, this one guy did it by accident in Australia and had the worst day ever in, in terms of networking, not in terms of real life. Um, 
they just decided we would like to read all the traffic on the internet today, particularly that dot mil traffic. That is very interesting traffic. And so these are good examples because you can see when you try to do a big hijack, you have to yell all at once. You have to, you have to be very bursty and issue many, many uh, announcements. And we looked at the view from four different route views locations. So route views are obtained by putting a ob observation point in a telecommunications, a major telecommunication provider. This shows you uh, four different route views providers, one in San Paulo, one in Australia. Oh gosh, now I'm stressed out and I forgot where Route Views 2 comes from. And you can see that different, different locations have different views of the internet. But by looking at burstiness, we can identify early attacks. Why is that? Because they've got to diffuse the route. And if you can identify an attack, so for example, I showed you somebody did um, a slash 26 to get around the slash 24. So what you do is you send out a bunch of 28s. So you can correct it. You can't just refuse it though. It takes an active response. So we, oh, I meant that to be four attacks. So what I've talked to you about is incentive aligned design. Some first and order, second order deployment effects like BGP sec is only going to work when everybody does it. And if everybody did it, then the people we didn't trust would be doing it. They'd just be doing it with cryptography, um, which was the point of the Denver attack. We've talked about how individual organizations would have different incentives diffusion of the information about the network and using criminology to inform our design of defenses against BGP hijacking. The things we did not talk about was designed for human factors. It turns out human fingers have not changed. Uh, misconfiguration due to inexperience is often a case where you get new people coming in, people are expanding. Um, I will say manners has been the most successful intervention. It's absolutely about the people, but it's about a very highly educated people. Uh, what are you going to do if it's your house that's targeted? So the general kind of things I'd like to make is we implemented filtering of data flows at the party that was getting exfiltrated. You have to accept route updates from the BGP control plane. You cannot reject them, but you can make decisions about them. And you can use alternative network protocols. And finally, local information can be more powerful with global information that we used different models. I know I'm just gonna say heresy here. You can have different models with different outcomes and the human decision-making or overall decision-making will be enhanced by that. So here's our vision of Bonga, sorry, Bongo. Quagga translates an update on the network, a BGP update about the ownership or path to a specific internet protocol in the router information base. And then what we do is we translated that to flows. We're like, all right, we're gonna take each of these routes and look at it in completion, not just what the next hop is, but what is the total route. And then we were working on building an API for decision-making, which is work in progress. Oh, here's my design philosophy, economic alignment of security, be agnostic about the protocol, um, look at, the human in the loop. AI and HI need to work together. Local data is not equivalent to global data. I know I've said that twice. I really want to stress it. It's particularly true in things like phishing, where we've also used this, but it's a much easier sell to say phishing needs a human-centered 
result than it is to say, you know, BGP hijacking needs to include human considerations and decision makings. You allow user discretion, people are allowed to take risk, we're allowed to speed, we're allowed to make stupid personal decisions. You need to have informed risk taking. Making human and artificial intelligence work together is about allowing a human to understand why the machine learning is making a decision. It doesn't have to understand all the features. It may just be like, this route is really long. This route goes to another country. Could we pause and is provided actionable information? I don't know how many of you have the experience where you have some kind of uh, alert in your computer and you're like, okay. Uh, the way we do it technically is we repeat trace route runs. We are looking constantly for perturbation. We integrate offline information about, for example, the quality of governance in a jurisdiction. And we leverage the features that we believe will harm the attacker's progress. So every attack domain is unique, but there's not one in which you cannot use this approach which is understanding the requirements for attack, leverage those to identify the features we wanna stop, recognize that not all data are equal and interrogate whatever proxy variable, variable you've come up with. In general, in security, I think we're about where we were in the 40s with car design when we're like, oh man, the car is gonna survive, but like the human in it, I mean, this cop is very sad for a reason. And now we understand how to make the car collapse around the human. We need to do the same thing with computer security. Right now we're building these things. The computer keeps working, but it turns out the organization and the data and the humans that are at risk are a digital disaster. So um, here's my papers. And I know you're not gonna read all of this now, but these are the most relevant papers and they will be in the slides. And thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much, Jean. That was really interesting. And um, I, uh, I really like the way you sort of bring in uh, uh, these different approaches from, from, uh, from different uh, disciplines and, and think about them in this way. Uh, we have uh, time for some questions. Feel free, everyone, to put in any questions you have in the Q&A. And um, I'll start with, there's a question here from Ethan Katz Bassett. He asks, how do you differentiate the burstiness of hijacks from other causes of births like BGP session flaps, router outages, et cetera? Because, um, so we just got this paper in networks and I'm super excited about that. They, they really are uh, observably different. The rate is not, because if you have a system that has high, flapping, right? You have a long history of flapping. And on that route, you're going to get this kind of rate of updates, right? That is, you can characterize route flapping pretty well. You may not be able to do anything about it, but you can statistically characterize it. And these, uh, the burstiness that is associated with hijacks is, we found it to be like, an order of magnitude difference. And by using burstiness, we were able to uh, detect these hijack events earlier than they were reportedly detected in real life. I, in, in literally, in one case, 10% of the time. Sorry, my cat's bothering me. I, I'm a bad staff, sorry. <laughs> Um, and I have, I think, a related question to that. Um, so in, in the data that you had where you were looking at um, anomalies, did you, did you have either always or in some cases some kind of ground truth that you were able to, um, you know, th that these things had, had in some cases been identified as um, an anomalies caused by criminal activity versus anomalies caused by outages and things like that? Or did you, um, you know, just do yeah. No, we were, that is a great question. And we were able to, and I'd like to shout out to Aaron Kennelly here. We were able to obtain some high quality labeled data working with CADA 
and Cisco. Um, we did get the three years of data, we completed the project, and we see some of the same patterns in the, in the follow-up. We're, we're running, of course, a follow-up project. That's all under review. And we're and and some of the day some of the projects we're doing are focused on IoT, where we generated our own. All right, I give up. We generated our own. Yes, I know. Our own data and hand examine it from homes and from uh, experiments. We kind of cheated there. We did our own hijack to see if our system would observe it. So. The question as to whether or not there are undetected hijacks and the previous question about burstiness are quite interesting because we did see a few things that were borderline internet scale hijacking and the burstiness that were not associated with, you know, in the literature with common cases of route flapping, but I did not have the information to assert that these were large scale hijacks. And, but we did find a handful of those in our analysis of burstiness. Thanks, and we have another question uh, from Juhan. How can we disincentivize hackers who engage in BGP hijacking? Well, I think that if you look at where they are generated, the best way to uh, disincentivize them is not to let them have a payoff, is to make sure that they are interrupted before they get the data. And this is one of those situations where it's often discussed like, oh, this is a global problem, we need a global solution. But honestly, if the US stopped hijacking itself, if we could just get the major um, US entities to adopt RPKI, so all of the IP addresses allocated to in, you know, domestically were protected. I think that would be a huge step forward in stopping attackers from being able to leverage our national vulnerability. I also think that there will insecurity that is not one word in law of security continue to be a role for human intelligence in addition to artificial intelligence because sometimes we need to take or choose to take risk and other times they're avoidable and that is uh, often a fundamentally a question about value or values and therefore it is the human who is potentially at risk who can make that choice. Great. And a question from Liliana Trykovic. Have you used route views and or ripe data sets? If so, have you seen any difference in the collected data? Oh, yeah. When we were doing, uh, we used global data. We got the, all the, route found huge differences based on where you were observing the network. I can, I know you're not gonna read all these papers, but I'll go ahead and sit now. And it really goes into detail. And I, you know, I was very excited at just saying, hey, this is a, sorry, I don't bring my cat to every, <laughs> So, uh, I think that went in the chat just to the panelists, but let me. Uh, oh, sorry. Get it to everyone. Uh, here we Thank go. Thank you. Sure. There you go. And your, you know, your point is well taken. There was a really very good talk at Enigma, I guess, two weeks ago, where there was a gentleman who was talking about the Colombian banking infrastructure and how assumptions that are made when you are designing anti-virus technology anti and malware detection for American banks completely fails in the forms and the different expectations and patterns of use. There are 
banking applications in WhatsApp. There's a lot more app and app development. So if you, there are definitely many sets of problems where you have to have a more locally informed solution and you cannot generalize it. And we did find evidence of that looking at different, uh, different collectors at different physical locations across the internet. Thanks, that was a great question. Um, and I have another question. This is maybe somewhat of a vague question, but um, so, so with the idea of trying to sort of use better human understanding to think about the means at the disposal of the attackers and the incentives of the attackers, it seems like if you get that right, it um, helps you to better identify attacks because you know what you're looking for. Um, but I'm wondering if there, if it does add an additional risk in the sense that if you get it wrong, you might miss whole classes of attacks because they don't conform to the model that you, you know, sort of developed using your intelligence, but, but happen to be wrong in that case. That is a chronic systematic problem. And I think that, you know, Solar Winds has illustrated that better than anything. The original VPN technology fingerprinted you. It fingerprinted your phone. It was like, it is, oh, that was weird. It is this phone that Gene is authenticating from. And then it integrated feedback it continuously to the point where it was only looking for location. So the attackers were able to use a subverted computer in the same community as the, you know, as the legitimate employees. So bringing, stepping back periodically and with human intelligence, re-interrogating the state of your machine, not just when you know it has detected an anomaly, but also simply periodically to see what it is doing because your attackers are regularly testing it. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you. That was a great question. <laughs> so I don't see any more questions in the chat. And of course, this is the time when we would applaud you. And I feel that applause is one of the things that really does not work so well on Zoom. So I'm going to do this for a little while <laughs> on behalf of everyone in the audience um, as your applause. And then I will also, of course, thank our attendees for coming. And um, I believe uh, in the chat, Alexis put, if you would like to be on the data science newsletter. Uh, I would love to be on the data science newsletter. That. I love the, I'm so happy to be here yeah. because this uh, institute has a wonderful combination of, of understanding that good engineering embeds social justice. That Absolutely. if it does not work for a large part of the population, it doesn't work. You know, the bridge, it only falls down for blue cars. You know, we can't do that. <laughs> yeah, so great. And that's a great uh, note to kind of wrap things up on uh, the whole purpose of these data for good uh, seminars are to look at ways that using data science, using engineering, uh, we can help improve society. So again, thank you, Jean. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. thank you so much. <laughs> great, thank you all.